Chapter 7, Half and Half As proof of her faith, my mother used to carry a small leather leatherette Bible when she went to the First Chinese Baptist Church every Sunday. But later, after my mother lost her faith in God, that leatherette Bible wound it up wedged under a two-short table leg, a way for her to correct the imbalance of life. It's been there for over 20 years. My mother pretends that Bible isn't there. Whenever anyone asks her what it's doing there, she says a little too loudly, Oh, this? I forgot. But I knew she sees it. My mother is not the best housekeeper in the world. And after all these years, that Bible is still clean white. Tonight, I'm watching my mother sweep under the same kitchen table, something she does every night after dinner. She gently pokes her broom around the table leg, propped up by the Bible. I watch her sweep after sweep, waiting for the right moment to tell her about Ted and me, that we're getting divorced. When I tell her, I know she's going to say, this cannot be. And when I say that it is certainly true that our marriage is over, I know what else she will say. Then you must save it. And even though I know it's hopeless, there's absolutely nothing left to save. I'm afraid if I tell her that, she'll still persuade me to try. I think it's ironic that my mother wants me to fight the divorce. 17 years ago, she was chagrined when I started dating Ted. My older sister had dated only Chinese boys from church before getting married. Ted and I met in a politics of ecology class when he leaned over and offered to pay me $2 for the last week's notes. I refused the money and accepted a cup of coffee instead. This was during my second year at UC Berkeley, where I had enrolled as a liberal arts major and later changed to fine arts. Ted was in his third year in pre-med, his choice, he told me, ever since he dissected a fetal pig in the sixth grade. I have to admit, what I initially found attractive in Ted were precisely the things that made him different from my brothers and the Chinese boys I had dated. His brashness, the assertiveness in which he asked for things and expected to get them, his opinionated matter, his angular face and lanky body, the thickness of his arms, the fact that his parents immigrated from Terrytown, New York, not Tintin, China. My mother must have noticed these same differences after Ted picked me up one evening at my parents' house. When I returned home, my mother was still up watching television. He is American, warned my mother as if I had been too blind to notice, a wagwan. I'm American too, I said, and it's not as if I'm going to marry him or something. Mrs. Jordan also had a few words to say. Ted had casually invited me to a family picnic, the annual clan reunion held by the polo fields in Golden Gate Park. Although we had dated only a few times in the last month and certainly had never slept together, since both of us lived at home. Ted introduced me to all his relatives as his girlfriend, which until then, I didn't know I was. There, when Ted and his father went off to play volleyball with the others, his mother took my hand and we started walking along the grass away from the crowd. She squeezed my palm warmly, but never seemed to look at me. I'm so glad to meet you finally, Mrs. Jordan said. I wanted to tell her I wasn't really Ted's girlfriend, but she went on. I think it's nice that you and Ted are having such a lot of fun together, so I hope you won't misunderstand what I have to say. And then she spoke quietly about Ted's future, his need to concentrate on his medical studies, why it would be years before he could even think about marriage. She assured me that she had nothing whatsoever against minorities, She and her husband, who owned a chain of office supply stores, personally knew many fine people who were Oriental, Spanish, and even black. 
but Ted was going to be one of those professions where he would be judged by a different standard, by patients and other doctors who might not be as understanding as the Jordans were. She said it was so unfortunate that the way the rest of the world was, how unpopular the Vietnam War was. Mrs. Jordan, I'm not Vietnamese, I said softly, even though I was on the verge of shouting, and I have no intention of marrying your son. When Ted drove me home that day, I told him I couldn't see him anymore. When he asked me why, I shrugged. When he pressed me, I told him what his mother had said, verbatim, without comment. And you're just going to sit there? Let my mother decide what's right? He shouted, as if I were a co-conspirator who had turned traitor. I was touched that Ted was so upset. What should we do? I asked. And I had a pain feeling I thought, he, I thought was the beginning of love. In those early months, we clung to each other with a rather silly desperation, because in spite of anything my mother or Mrs. Jordan could say, there was nothing that really prevented us from seeing one another. With imagined tragedy hovering over us, he, we became inseparable, two halves creating the whole, yin and yang. I was victim to his hero. I was already in danger and he was already rescuing me. I would fall and he would lift me up. I was exhilarating and draining. The emotional effect of saving and being saved was addicting to both of us. And that, as much as anything we ever did in bed, was how we made love to each other. Conjoined where my weakness needed protection. What should we do? I continued to ask him. And within a year of our first meeting, we were living together. The month before Ted started medical school at UCSF, we were married in the Episcopal Church and Mrs. Jordan sat in the front pew crying as was expected of the groom's mother. When Ted finished his residency in dermatology, we bought a rundown three-story Victorian with a large garden in Ashbury Heights. Ted helped me set up a studio downstairs so I can take in work as a freelance production assistant for graphic artists. Over the years, Ted decided where we went on vacation. He decided what new furniture we should buy. He decided we should wait until we moved into a better neighborhood before having children. We used to discuss some of these matters, but we both knew the question would boil down to me saying, Ted, you decide. After a while, there were no more discussions. Ted simply decided and I never thought of objecting. I preferred to ignore the world around me, obsessing only over what was in front of me. My T-squares, my X-acto knife, my blue pencil. But last year, Ted's feelings about what he called decision and responsibility changed. A new patient had come to him, asking what she could do about the spidery veins in her cheeks. And when he told her he could suck the red veins out and make her beautiful again, she believed him. But instead, he accidentally sucked a nerve out, and the left side of her smile fell down, and she sued him. After he lost the malpractice lawsuit, the first and a big shock to him, I now realize, he started pushing me to make decisions. Did I think we should buy an American car or a Japanese car? Should we change from whole life to term insurance? What did I think about the candidates who support the contrast? What about a family? I thought about things, the pros and the cons. But in the end, I would be so confused because I never believed there was ever any one right answer. Yet there were many wrong ones. So whenever I said, you decide, or I don't care, or either way is fine with me, Ted would say in his impatient voice, no, you decide. You can't have it both ways. None of the responsibility, none of the blame. 
I could feel things changing between us. A protective veil had been lifted and Ted now started pushing me about everything. He asked me to decide on the most trivial matters, as if he were baiting me. Italian food or Thai? One appetizer or two? Which appetizer? Credit card or cash? Visa or MasterCard? Last month, when he was leaving for a two-day dermatology course in Los Angeles, he asked if I wanted to come along, and then quickly, before I could say anything, he added, Never mind, I'd rather go alone. More time to study, I agreed. No, because you can never make up your mind about anything, he said, and I protested. But it's only with things that aren't important. Nothing is important to you, then, he said in a tone of disgust. Ted, if you want me to go, I'll go. And it was as if something snapped in him. How the hell did we ever get married? Did you just say I do because the min minister said repeat after me? What would you have done with your life if I had never married you? Did it ever occur to you? This was such a big leap in logic between what I said and what he said, and I thought we were like two people standing apart on separate mountain peaks, recklessly leaning forward to throw stones at one another, unaware of the dangerous chasm that separated us. But now I realized Ted knew what he was saying all along. He wanted to show me the rift, because later that evening he called from Los Angeles and said he wanted a divorce. Ever since Ted's been gone, I've been thinking, even if I had expected it, even if I had known what I was going to do with my life, it still would have knocked the wind out of me. When something that violent hits you, you can't help but lose your balance and fall. And after you pick yourself up, you realize you can't trust anybody to save you. Not your husband, not your mother, not God. So what can you do to stop yourself from tilting and falling over again? My mother believed in God's will for many years. It was as if she had turned on a celestial faucet and goodness kept pouring out. She said it was faith that kept all these good things coming our way. Only I thought she said fate because she couldn't pronounce that TH sound in faith. And later I discovered that maybe it was fate all along, that faith was just an illusion, and that somehow you're in control. I found out the most I could have was hope, and with that I was not denying any possibility good or bad. I was just saying, if there is a choice, dear God or whatever you are, here's where the odds should be placed. I remember the day I started thinking this. It was such a revolution to me. It was the day my mother lost her faith in God. She found that things of unquestioned certainty could never be trusted again. We had gone to the beach to a secluded spot south of the city near Devil's Slide. My father had read in Sunset Magazine that this was a good place to catch ocean perch. And although my father was not a fisherman but a pharmacist's assistant who had once been a doctor in China, he believed in Nengang, his ability to do anything he put his mind to. My mother believed she had Nengong to cook anything my father had a mind to catch. It was this belief in their Nengong that had brought my parents to America. It had enabled them to have seven children and buy a house in the Sunset District with very little money. It had given them the confidence to believe their luck would never run out, that God was on their side that the house God had only benevolent things to report, and our ancestors were, were pleased that lifetime warranties meant our lucky streak would never break, that all the elements in balance, the right amount of wind and water. So there we were, the nine of us, my father, my mother, my two sisters, four brothers, and myself, so confident as we walked along our first beach. 
we marched in single file across the cool gray sand from oldest to youngest. I was in the middle, 14 years old. We could have made quite a sight. If anyone else had been watching, nine pairs of bare feet trudging, nine pairs of shoes in hand, nine black-haired heads turned toward the water to watch the waves tumbling in. The wind was whipping the cotton trousers around my legs, and I looked for some place where the sand wouldn't kick into my eyes. I saw we were standing in the hollow of a cove. It was like a giant bowl cracked in half, the other half washed out to sea. My mother walked toward the right, where the beach was clean, and we all followed. On this side, the wall of the cove curved around and protected the beach from both the rough surf and the wind. And along this wall, in it shadowed was a reef ledge that started at the edge of the beach and continued out past the cove where the waters became rough. It seemed as though a person could walk out to sea on this reef, although it looked very rocky and slippery. On the other side of the cove, the wall was more jagged eaten away by water. It was pitted with crevices, so when the waves crashed against the wall, all the water spewed out of these holes like white gullies. Thinking back, I remember that this beach cove was a terrible place, full of wet shadows that chilled us, and invisible specks that flew into our eyes and made it hard for us to see the dangers. We were all blind with the newness of this experience. A Chinese family trying to act like a typical American family at the beach. My mother spread out an old striped bedspread, which flapped in the wind until nine pairs of shoes weighed it down. My father assembled his long bamboo fishing pole, a pole he had made with his own two hands remembering its design from his childhood in China. And we children sat huddled shoulder to shoulder on the blanket, reaching into the grocery sack full of bologna sandwiches, which we hungrily ate salted with sand from our fingers. Then my father stood up and admired his fishing pole, its grace, its strength. Satisfied, he picked up his shoes and walked to the edge of the beach and then onto the reef to the point just before it was wet. My two older sisters, Janice and Ruth, jumped up from the blanket and slapped their thighs to get the sand off. Then they slapped each other's back and raced off down the beach shrieking. I was about to get up and chase them, but my mother nodded toward my four brothers and reminded me, Deng Xing Tam which means take care of them or literally watch out for their bodies. These bodies were the anchors of my life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Bing. I fell back onto the sand, groaned as my throat grew tight. As I made the same lament, why? Why did I have to care for them? And she gave me the same answer. Yi Ding. I must because they were my brothers. My sister had once taken care of me. How else could I learn responsibility? How else could I appreciate what my parents had done for me? Matthew, Mark, and Luke were 12, 10, and 9, old enough to keep themselves loudly amused. They had already buried Luke in the shallow grave of sand so that only his head stuck out. Now they were starting to pat together the outlines of a sandcastle wall on top of him. But Bing was only four, easily excitable and easily bored and irritable. He didn't want to play with the other brothers because they had pushed him off to the side, admonishing him, no Bing, you'll just wreck it. So Bing wandered down the beach, walking stiffly like an ousted emperor, picking up shards of rock and chunks of driftwood and flinging them with all his might into the surf. I trailed behind, imagining tidal waves and wondering what I would do if one appeared. I called to Bing every now and then, Don't go too close to the water. You'll get your feet wet. And I thought how much I seemed like my mother, 
always worried beyond reason inside, but at the same time talking about the dangers as if it were less than it really was. The worry surrounded me, like the wall of the cove, and it made me feel everything had been considered and was now safe. My mother had superstition, in fact, that children were predisposed to certain dangers on certain days, all depending on their Chinese birthday. It was explained in a little Chinese book called The 26 Malignant Gates. There on each page was an illustration of some terrible danger that awaited young innocent children. In the corner was a description written in Chinese, and since I couldn't read the characters, I could only see what the picture meant. The same little boy appeared in each picture, climbing a broken tree limb, standing by a falling gate, slipping in a wooden tub, being carried away by a snapping dog, fleeing from a bolt of lightning, and in each one of these pictures stood a man who looked as if he were wearing a lizard costume. He had a big crease in his forehead, or maybe it was actually that he had two round horns. In one picture, the lizard man was standing on a curved bridge laughing as he watched the little boy falling forward over the bridge rail, his slippered feet already in the air. It would have been enough to think that even one of these dangers could befall a, ch a child. And even though the birth dates corresponded to only one danger, my mother worried about them all. This was because she couldn't figure out how the Chinese dates based on the lunar calendar translated into American dates. So by taking them all into account, she had absolute faith she could prevent every one of them. The sun had shifted and moved over the other side of the cove wall. Everything had settled into place. My mother was busy keeping sand from blowing onto the blanket, then shaking sand out of shoes and tacking corners of blankets down again with the now clean shoes. My father was still standing at the end of the reef, patiently casting out, waiting for a neck gun to manifest itself as a fish. I could see small figures further down on the beach, and I could tell they were my sisters by their two dark heads and yellow pants. My brother's shrieks were mixed with those of seagulls. Bing had found an empty soda bottle and was using this to dig sand next to the dark cove wall. And I sat on the sand just where the shadows ended and the sunny part began. Bing was pounding the soda bottles against the rock, so I called him, Don't dig so hard. You'll bust a hole in the wall and fall all the way to China. And I laughed when he looked at me as though he thought what I said was true. He stood up and started walking toward the water. He put one foot tentatively on the reef and I warned him, Bing, I'm gonna see daddy, he protested. Stay close to the wall, then away from the water, I said. Stay away from the mean fish. And I watched as he inched his way along the reef. His back hugged the bumpy cove wall. I still see him so clearly that I almost feel I can make him stay there forever. I see him standing by the wall safe, calling to my father, who looks over his shoulder towards Bing. How glad I am that my father is going to watch him for a while. Bing starts to walk over and then something tugs on my father's line and he's reeling as fast as he can. Shouts erupt. Someone has thrown sand in Luke's face and he's jumped out of his sand grave and thrown himself on top of Mark, thrashing and kicking. My mother shouts for me to stop them, and right after I pulled Luke off Mark, I looked up and see Bing walking along to the edge of the reef. In the confusion of the fight, nobody noticed. I am the only one who sees that what Bing is doing. Bing walks one, two, three steps. His little body is moving so quickly as if he spotted something wonderful by the water's edge. I think he's going to fall in. I'm expecting it. And just as I think this, his feet are already in the air in the moment of balance before he splashes into the sea and disappears without leaving so much as a ripple in the water. I sank to my knees, watching that spot where he disappeared, not moving, not saying anything, 
I couldn't make sense of it. I was thinking, should I run to the water and try and try to pull him out? Should I shout to my father? Can I rise on my legs fast enough? Can I take it all back and forbid Bing from joining my father on the ledge? And then my sisters were back, and one of them said, Where's Bing? There was a silence for a, sec- for a few seconds, and then shouts and sand flying as everyone rushed past me toward the water's edge. I stood there unable to move as my sisters looked by the cove wall, as my brothers scrambled to see what lay behind pieces of driftwood. My mother and father were trying to part the waves with their hands. We were there for many hours. I remember the search boats and the sunset when dusk came. I had never seen a sunset like that. A bright orange flame touching the water's edge and then fanning out, warming the sea. When it became dark, the boats turned their yellow orbs on and bounced up and down on the dark, shiny water. As I look back, it seemed unnatural to think about the colors of the sunset and boats at a time like that. But we all had strange thoughts. My father was calculating minutes, estimating temperature of the water, readjusting his estimates of when Bing fell. My sisters were calling, Bing, Bing, as if he were hiding in some bushes high above the beach cliffs. My brother sat in the car quietly, reading comic books. And when the boats turned off their yellow orbs, my mother went for a swim. She had never swum a stroke in her life. But her faith in her own Nengang convinced her that what these Americans couldn't do, she could. She could find Bing. And when the rescue people finally pulled her out of the water, she still had her Nengang intact. Her hair, her clothes, they were all heavy with the cold water. But she stood quietly, calm and regal as a mermaid queen who had just arrived out of the sea. The police called off the search put us all in our car, and sent us home to grieve. I had expected to be beaten to death by my father, by my mother, by my sisters and brothers. I knew it was my fault. I hadn't watched him closely enough, and yet I saw him. But as we sat in the dark living room, I heard them, one by one, whispering their regrets. I was selfish to want to go fishing, said my father. We shouldn't have gone for a walk, said Janice, while Ruth blew her nose yet another time. Why'd you have to throw sand in my face, moaned Luke. Why'd you have to make me start a fight? And my mother quietly admitted to me, I told you to stop their fight. I told you to take your eyes off him. If I had had any time at all to feel a sense of relief, it would have quickly evaporated, because my mother also said, So now I am telling you, we must go and find him, quickly, tomorrow morning, and everybody's eyes looked down. But I saw it as my punishment to go out with my mother back to the beach to help her find Bing's body. Nothing prepared me for what my mother did the next day. When I woke up, it was still dark. She was already dressed. On the kitchen table was a thermos, a teacup while the white leatherette bible and the car keys is daddy ready i asked daddy's not coming she said then how will we get there who will drive us she picked up the keys and i followed her out the door to the car i wondered the whole time as we drove to the beach how she had learned to drive overnight she used no map she drove smoothly ahead turning down geary then the great highway signaling at all the right times getting on the coast highway and easily winding the car around the sharp curves that often led inexperienced drivers off and over the cliff. When we arrived at the beach, she walked immediately down the dirt path and over to the end of the reef ledge, where I had seen Bing disappear. She had held in her hand the white Bible, and looking out over the water, she called to God, her small voice carried up by the gulls to heaven, It began with dear God and ended with amen, and in between she spoke in Chinese. I have always believed in your blessings, she praised God, in that same tone she used for exaggerated Chinese compliments. We knew they would come. We did not question them. Your decisions were our decisions. You reward us with our faith. 
In return, we have always tried to show our deepest respect. We went to your house. We, we brought you money. We sang your songs. You gave us more blessings, and now we have misplaced one of them. We were careless. This is true. We had so many good things. We couldn't keep them in our minds all the time. So maybe you hid him from us to teach us a lesson, to be more careful with our gifts in the future. I have learned this. I have put it in my memory, and now I have come to take Bing back. I listened quietly as my mother said these words, horrified, and I began to cry when she added, Forgive us for his bad manners. My daughter, this one standing here, will be sure to teach him better lessons of obedience before he visits you again. After her prayer, her faith was so great that she saw him three times, waving to her from just beyond the waves. Nale, there! And she would stand straight as a sentinel until three times her eyesight failed her and Bing turned into a dark spot of churning seaweed. My mother did not let her chin fall down. She walked back to the beach and put the Bible down. She picked up the thermos and teacup and walked to the water's edge. Then she told me that the night before she had reached back into her life, back when she was a girl in China, and this is what she had found. I remember a boy who lost his hand in a firecracker accident, she said. I saw the shred of his boy's arm, his tears, and then I heard his mother's claim that he would grow back another hand, better than the last. This mother said she would pay back an ancestral debt ten times over. She would use a water treatment to soothe the wrath of Chu Zheng, the three-eyed god of fire. And true enough, the next week, this boy was riding a bicycle, both hands steering a straight course past my astonished eye. And then my mother became very quiet. She spoke again in a thoughtful, respectful manner. An ancestor of ours once stole water from a sacred well. Now the water is trying to steal back. We must sweeten the temper of the coiling dragon who lives in the sea. And then we must make him loosen his coil from Bing by giving him another treasure he can hide. My mother poured out tea sweetened with sugar into the teacup and threw this tea into the sea. And then she opened her fist. In her palm was a ring of watery blue sapphire, a gift from her mother who had died many years before. This ring, she told me, drew coveting stares from women and made them inattentive to the children they guarded so jealously. This would make the coiling dragon forgetful of Bing. She threw the ring into the water. But even with this, Bing did not appear right away. For an hour or so, all we saw was seaweed drifting by. And then I saw her slap her hands to her chest. She said in a wondrous voice, See, it's because we were watching the wrong directions. And I too saw Bing trudging wearily at the far end of the beach, his shoes dragging in his hands, his dark head bent over in exhaustion. I could feel what my mother felt. The hunger in her hearts was instantly filled. And then the two of us, before we could even get to our feet, saw him light a cigarette, grow tall, and become a stranger. Ma, let's go, I said softly as possible. He's there, she said firmly. She pointed to the jagged wall across the water. I see him. He's in a cave, sitting on a little step above the water. He is hungry and a little cold, but he has learned now not to complain too much. And then she stood up and started walking across the sandy beach as though it were a solid paved path, and I was trying to follow behind, struggling and stumbling in the soft mound. She marched up the step path to where the car was parked, and she wasn't even breathing hard as she pulled a large inner tube from the trunk. To this lifesaver, she tried the fishing line from my father's bamboo pole. She walked back and threw the tube into the sea, holding onto the pole. This will go where Bing is. I will bring him back she said fiercely. I had never heard so much Nangong in my mother's voice. The tube followed her mind. It drifted out toward the other side of the cove where it was caught by stronger waves. The line became taut. She strained to hold on tight, but the line snapped and then spiraled into the water. We both climbed toward the end of the reef to watch. The tube had now reached the other side of the cove, 
A big wave smashed into the wall. The bloated tube leapt up and then it was sucked in under the wall and into the cavern. It popped out over and over again. It disappeared, emerged, glistened back, faithfully reporting it had seen Bing and was going back to try to pluck him from the cave. Over and over again, it dove and popped back up again, empty but still hopeful. And then after a dozen or so times, it was sucked into the dark recess and when it came out, it was torn and lifeless. At that moment, and not until that moment, did she give up. My mother had a look on her face I'll never forget. It was one of complete despair and horror for losing Bing. For being so foolish as to think she could use faith to change fate. And it made me angry, so blindingly angry, that everything had failed us. I know now that I had never expected to find Bing, just that as I know now, I will never find a way to save my marriage. My mother tells me, though, that I should still try. What's the point, I said. There's no hope. There's no reason to keep trying. Because you must, she said. This is not hope, not reason. This is your fate. This is your life, what you must do. So what can I do? And my mother said, you must think for yourself what you must do. If someone tells you, then you are not trying. And then she walks out of the kitchen to let me think about this. I think about Bing, how I knew he was in danger, how I let it happen. I think about my marriage, how I had seen the signs, really I had. But I just let it happen. And I think now that fate is shaped half by expectation, half by inattention. But somehow, when you lose something you love, faith takes over. You have to pay attention to what you lost. You have to undo the expectation. My mother, she will pay attention to it. That Bible under the table, I know she sees it. I remember seeing her write in it before she wedged it under. I lift the table and slid the Bible out. I put the Bible on the table, flipping quickly through the pages, because I know it's there. On the page before the New Testament begins, there's a section called Deaths, and that's where she wrote Bing Tzu, lightly an erasable pencil.